it's, it's great to see so many people here for what is really the social justice issue that has eluded people for 64 years plus. I'm not someone who's a blind utopian or idealist. I think I've just been um, recently in Israel and Palestine and anyone who spends time there sees very clearly that the situation there is hardly about to be a utopia tomorrow. Things are profoundly almost set in their ways. Um, but one thing we talk about in the book, and as someone who spends yeah, too much time online, is that there is undoubtedly a disconnect between the reality on the ground and the kind of conversations that are now being had um, online, Twitter, blogging, etc., from people particularly based in the West Bank and Israel and Gaza. So whereas years ago you would have foreign correspondents who would go to those places, report back, mostly from a fairly pro-Israel perspective, what you have now at least is a, a wider degree of voices, some of which are in the book. So I don't say that that therefore has fundamentally shifted the political reality, but I think what it has done is made it far easier for in many countries, including here, that the pro-Palestinian perspective is far more heard, despite what the mainstream media doesn't report, and public opinion has fundamentally shifted in Australia in the last five or ten years. The only country in the Western world where that hasn't really happened is the US for a range of reasons, but there are shifts happening there as well. Okay, so can we just, Anthony, go right back to the need for this book at all after Zionism? Yeah. Um, when, we, when we talk about Israel-Palestine, isn't the solution not about deconstructing Zionism, but Israel just getting out of the West Bank, going back to the Green Line, uh, sticking by, you know, Arab uh, proposals for peace um, and stopping the occupation. Why do we need to talk about Zionism? One of the reasons the book was written was that the conversations began and three years ago, about in 2009. For many of you in the audience, you might know a website called Mondo Weiss, which is run by two American Jews. And I'm friends with both of them. And there was a conversation about three years ago about doing some kind of book edited by the three of us. And it soon became clear that having three Jews would be a little bit boring. Um, I mean, interesting, but a little bit like, yeah, OK, three Jews, whatever. So uh, inevitably, although three of us are all very secular and non-practicing. that's anti-Semitic. No, I think that's just a statement of fact. I mean, just to have three Jews is, you know, let's, let's try and mix it up a little bit. Yeah. So I ended up um, forming a, an online relationship of sorts with a guy called Ahmed Moore, who's a Palestinian from Gaza, living in America. And as an example of how these new relationships work, I never actually met him in person until three weeks ago in London. So he and I had done a book together for the last really year and a half, roughly, and never actually met. We obviously would Skype, we'd email, we got to know each other, but never actually met in person. I think that's symptomatic in some ways of how a Australian Jew from Melbourne living in Sydney can work with a Palestinian American living in uh, the US, in Boston. So the idea of the book was more to say that after 20 odd years of Oslo and a two-state solution narrative and all that that comes with it, we felt that there was a need, and we were obviously not the only people saying this, but there was a need to say that 20 years of propaganda in some ways has been so successful. It's been so successful of convincing so many people in the political elites for different reasons, many in the media, that the only way forward, if only Israel and the Palestinians got in a room, sat down, sorted their shit out, there'd be peace. And the truth of the matter is that the facts on the ground, putting aside the morality question, the facts on the ground when you now have up to 700,000 Jewish settlers living in the West Bank, any kind of equitable partition, a just partition, is impossible. So a one-state solution was not, not the first people to talk about it. It's been discussed for decades. But what has changed in the last five years, and the web has undoubtedly facilitated that, is to make the conversation within Palestinian communities, some Jewish communities, and the wider communities far more open and discuss. So rather than normally mentioning and being told that's anti-Semitic because it denies the right of Israel to be a Jewish state, a one-state solution would mean Israel would not be a Jewish state. It'd be a, a Palestinian majority country, which would, in my vision, be secular. It could well be Muslim. Who knows? That's not a decision for me to make. So the underpinning of the book was to posit ideas that have been around for a while, but to get some writers Jews, Palestinians, Americans, and others to talk about perspectives that often they haven't talked about so much in public before.
and to be provocative and to sort of say, unless the conversation changes, unless we actually imagine what a just one state would look like. And the idea of one state is not that revolutionary. I mean, one looks back, and I'll finish with this, one looks back at the uh, writings of many white South Africans in the 70s and 80s. And the conversation about forming a single state with black South Africans is seen as so abhorrent, not, because, not just because of the racism, but the idea that if we live, as they would argue, with blacks, there's going to be mass slaughter of us as whites. And no one would say in 2012 that the reality of South Africa is utopian. There are profound problems in that country. It's economic apartheid now, really, in South Africa. But the truth is it is, a, it is one state of sorts. So a lot of that rhetoric that we hear now about Israel-Palestine, I think, is exaggerated to maintain Jewish privilege at the expense of Palestinian rights. So the book was about challenging that. OK, so, so giving up on the two-state solution. The peace process, this is one of the things we talk about in the book and we really uncover that, is to say that a peace process is a rhetorical cover for colonisation. So when you've heard the concept of a peace process for now 20 odd years since Oslo in 93, next year will be the anniversary, yay, let's celebrate that, then there is a belief that in all negotiations, this has been written about extensively by a variety of different figures on both sides, there was never any serious attempt by the Israelis to give up colonisation. In the 90s when there was supposedly the most serious attempt at a peace process under the Labour then government, the settlements in fact doubled in size. So, in fact, in many ways, over the last 20 years, settlements have, got, have, have done far better under Labor than under Likud. People often forget that reality. Likud is the more hardline, Netanyahu is the current Prime Minister, it's Likud. But settlements often do better under Labor. So, but what you're saying is the two-state solution is dead. That it is conceivable that there will be an enforced two-state equation where it is imaginable, and many people in this movement around the world worry about this, that there could be a White House lawn ceremony. It is imaginable to me that you have a US president, let's say it's Obama, Netanyahu for argument's sake, someone else, Olmert is now talking about coming back, and a Palestinian leader, whoever that is, shaking on the White House lawn, imagining, a two, and not imagining, codifying a two-state so-called solution. That to me is possible. Now, it would not be a just solution, it wouldn't be equitable. And the fear is that the Palestinian Authority, which of course is clearly one of the key problems of this, would accept that because their arm is so twisted by financial um, complicity that they may well go along with that. Now, would it be accepted by Palestinians? Would it be accepted by a lot of people? That's the unknown, but that to me is conceivable. So is a two-state solution impossible? No. Would it be viable? No. Let's go back to the beginning. Um, Zionism. Uh, what is it? Can you define it? Yeah, I mean, in, in one sentence, Zionism really is the idea that Jews, it was formed in the late 1800s as a, as a philosophy to believe that Jews in Europe who felt persecuted by being Jewish, and this was partly based on the Dreyfus case in France where there was anti-Semitism, clear anti-Semitism, had the need for a Jewish state. There was a need for a state that protected Jews from the range of anti-Semitism that existed. And within less than 50 years, it was a reality. There was a Jewish state in Palestine. As many people will know, there was a discussion about maybe making that state elsewhere, in parts of Australia, Uganda, elsewhere, um, which would have been odd, to say the least. But nonetheless, it was decided for a variety of reasons, not least the Holocaust, and the, what was seen as a historical justification for a Jewish state after the Holocaust in Palestine. So. That's what Zionism is, and it's become an incredibly powerful, evocative ideology in much of the Jewish and popular worlds. Okay, so are, are you saying, uh, by virtue of the title after Zionism, and then linking it to the one-state solution, that you can only get a one-state solution when you get rid of that Zionist vision? Yes and no. One of the issues we talk about in the book and I've discussed in a lot of my work is that to me and to many, not as many Jews as I would like, but for many of us, Zionism is the inherent problem here. The idea that Zionism can be reformed or reframed is I think problematic because ultimately Zionism is a belief in exclusivity for Jews. It is about an underlying belief that Jews have the right to a state and there's nothing inherently wrong with Jews having a state. There's nothing wrong with Muslims having a state. 
That's not the issue here. That's not the issue with what Israel is and what it's become. The key point is that Israel has become a discriminatory state against non-Jews. That is the issue. So if, if you ask me, is it conceivable that Zionism could be fundamentally shifted to make it less, less keen to colonise? Yes, in theory, I guess that's possible. But to me, the idea of a one-state solution is a process where we talk about in the book, and there are chapters in the book, where Israel needs to be de -Zionized. There needs to be an understanding both within Israel itself, but also in the international community and in the Jewish diaspora, who are clearly complicit, my own community, not that I'm really much of a part of it, but the Jewish diaspora is complicit deeply in the colonization project without Jewish diaspora support, particularly in the US, here, elsewhere. Israel would not exist. The only way that it's existing is because of those realities. It's an important point though, isn't it? Because I notice in the book that there's, there's actually a disagreement between Yelan Pape and Jeff Halper, both oh. Friends of Palestine, yeah, uh, and uh, Jeff Halper says that colonisation is not an essential element of Zionism. It doesn't have to be. It's not essential to it. Pape, on the other hand, says the opposite. Mm. He says it is by nature uh, a colonising movement. Where do you stand on that? Uh, can you have a non-colonising? Zionist state. I generally share Pape's view about that, but having said that, this is the kind of conversation actually that does need to be had. It's not the question, you know, the expression, you know, like an inside baseball kind of conversation where Jews are talking amongst themselves about whether Zionism is about colonization or not. This is an important point about what Jewish identity, which in much of the last 60 to 100 years, something like 60 years, is fundamentally revolving around a Jewish state. That now, for the majority of Jewish people, the idea that you are brought up, for argument's sake, as a Jewish anti-Zionist is pretty rare. It happens, but it's rare. It's integral to being Jewish. You may not be necessarily giving money to the settlements, but it is still central to your belief that it's important that Jews have a state. Um, in the book, you're right, there is a disagreement, different perspective, I and mean, there's another chapter by Jeremiah Haber, who's an Orthodox Jew, living in the um, US and Israel, who talks about the importance of a Hebrew culture. That the idea that in a one state solution, one state equation, call it whatever you want, there needs to be an acknowledgement and an understanding and a support that Hebrew culture, which can mean a range of things, a Hebrew language, Hebrew music, Hebrew identity, is important. It's not simply the idea that everything as he argues in the last 60 odd years, is fundamentally corrupt and rotten. And therefore we must start from the beginning. And I share his view about that too. Uh, he's, and he's someone who has been a very key critic as an Orthodox Jew and a practicing Orthodox Jew of a, if not a one state solution, certainly to getting past what Israel has become, which is a colonizing state. So uh, yes, I come down on Pape's side, but the debate needs to be had. And then the debates about Zionism, in my experience, are not being had because mostly in the media and in the political elites, no one wants to talk about this question because even questioning Zionism's right to occupy people's minds and talk about what an alternative to Zionism might be is seen as a bit too hot, so no one wants to go there. If the idea originally was a safe place from pogroms, is it not fair enough for Jewish insecurity, given that history only in the last 150 years, to feel we always need, we might be happy being Sydney siders, uh, we might be happy being in New York, but we also need to know that if that up, outburst of pogroms and so on happen in our country, we can always go there. It is entirely reasonable for many years that many Jews in parts of Europe, other parts of the world felt, rightly so, profoundly insecure about being Jewish. Yes, undeniably so. There are parts of the world now where being a Jew is dangerous. Having said all that, the problem that we have from day one, from 48 till now, is that Israel was formed and created and colonised on the back of another people. So you could argue that there are a lot of countries that have, so to speak, the right to exist. 
which I might add internationally has no basis in fact. We often hear in the media people denying Israel's right to exist. No country has a right to exist. There's no international law, legal principle which says you have a right to exist. You have a right not to be killed and to be safe and to be secure. You haven't got a right to exist per se. But I think ultimately the idea that we now have this disconnect, as you say, between the vast majority of Jews in the world don't want to move to Israel. They have no desire to move to Israel. And in fact, what's happened in the last decade or so is that Aliyah, so to speak, the movement from Jews to Israel, has pretty much stopped. There are some who go every year, but it's very small. So we now have this profoundly weird situation where you have the majority of the world's Jews who like the idea of a Jewish state over there in the Middle East at the expense of the Palestinians and Arabs and Bedouins, etc. Now that, to me, is a problem. That's why, in fact, particularly in the US, the country that arguably matters more than most on this question, growing numbers of young Jews, and this is coming up in the polling, growing numbers of young Jews are disconnecting from Israel because they say to themselves, okay, hang on a minute, I like to live in a multicultural country, the US, New York, wherever I am. And yet, if I visit Israel or I'm told about Israel, Israel is becoming increasingly the opposite of that, racially divided, racist, etc. Therefore, my supposed expectation to support Israel because of my grandmother in Auschwitz, or whatever the reason might be, is now breaking down. That's why in the next 5, 10, 15 years, which we should be worried about, the vast bulk of support in the US for Israel is coming from two groups, Orthodox Jews and Christian Evangelicals. And that should concern us. <laughs> Just let me go back to Ali Abanima's book, uh, One Country, which yes. came out in 2006, yep. uh, proposing a you know, one-state solution. Mm -hmm. So what, what, is, what is your book uh, adding to, to uh, a proposal like that? I think in some ways Ali Abunim's book was obviously a book just by him. It was an argument that a two-state solution was unworkable and unjust and therefore what a one-state solution should look like. What our book is trying to do is not necessarily just provide one view. It's not a manifesto. It is a range of writers, many of whom don't agree with each other. They haven't read each other's chapters in the book, but there are various chapters that talk about different issues what a one-state solution would look like in practice, how one tries to decolonize or de-Zionize the state, what, an, a, as I said, a Hebrew culture would look like, why a two-state solution doesn't work, hasn't worked, can't work. So it's a range of perspectives. As I said, not everyone agrees with each other. There's different views. There's people, as said, John Mearsheimer, who is a conservative realist you may all have heard of, who's the co-writer of the Israel Lobby, the book that came out uh, five years ago now, six years ago. He's hardly someone who you'd see as a radical, well some would see him as a radical, but he's not at all. He's a very mild-mannered conservative man who has come to the realisation, quite interestingly, that the idea that what does it actually, what will it take to change the mentality within the US to continue supporting Israel's colonisation approach? In other words, at what point does it actually happen that a political or media elite or the Jewish community itself says we are backing apartheid here and this is fundamentally at odds with our values. So the book really is a range of views which challenge, I guess it adds to Abinima's book, it's not supposed to replace it. came out six years ago, the situation on the ground is actually worse than since he wrote that book. I noticed that in your chapter, really you're kind of claiming that the debate about Zionism has taken off because of the internet. Is it? Is it true? Is well, that... no, what we're arguing is that it is now much easier to find out what is happening on the ground in these places. Now, even if the New York Times correspondent or the Washington Post correspondent or the Guardian is not necessarily reporting the perspectives that we think they should be, whether they're based in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, it is now very easy to read on popular, known websites, information. Now, you could argue, as you said in the introduction, Peter, that most people still consume the mainstream press. Absolutely correct. They do. And most people are not on Twitter. Facebook is a bit different, but most people aren't on Twitter or whatever. That's true. But you see in the last five years a real shift, I think, with the kind of perspectives that are being heard. The, the ability to organise is changing. One only has to look, for example, at the Gaza flotilla in the last th three years it's been planned. Now, 
the flotilla often has not actually made it to Gaza, once it did or twice, but hasn't actually made it since. But that almost is beside the point. What it has done is created a sense, and the organization and idea behind that is principally happening through organization online. That the people who are involved in here, the US, Europe, elsewhere, are organizing to raise the awareness that Gaza remains occupied, that Gaza is under siege by Israel and Egypt. And we shouldn't forget that although Egypt has slightly loosened the blockade, the blockade still continues. So we're not saying that the internet suddenly has liberated everybody about this debate, but what we are saying is that it has fundamentally allowed views to be heard that weren't heard before. And you know this because when you have a lot of um, IDF people on Twitter and Facebook arguing against individuals who are arguing another view, that means they know it's having an effect. And you also notice, finally, the amount of money that Israel is spending, massive amounts of money, on in uh, groups, individuals, to do yeah. things like leave comments on websites to say good Israel is, it's having an effect. Now, as people often say to me in response, on the ground it's still pretty bad. Absolutely. But these things don't change overnight. And we shouldn't forget that in the space of a few years, debate is shifting in a way that are now it's more possible to imagine, as we saw even in the last three months in the New York Times, which is a pretty pro-Israel publication, two articles that talk about use the term apartheid in Palestine and what a one-state solution would look like. That is a shift, and that's because the internet is driving it. In terms of this particular debate about Zionism and post-Zionism, uh, the effect of the new historian group, Ilan Pape and Avi Shlaim, the trickle-down effect of that onto Israeli consciousness uh, about what Israel's about and how it came to be would have had a, a subverted, a subverting effect on, uh, you know, the, the national narrative. I, I think it has. New historians basically have been around for over 20 years, so that's been a slow drip drip effect. But you know that these issues are shifting. Where if Israel is proposed and put into legislation, the idea that the Nakba, which is the um, ethnic cleansing in 48, when the Palestinians were forcibly removed from what was Israel, is now laws in Israel that makes it uh, partly illegal to do certain commemoration in relation to the Nakba. BDS, boycott, divestment, sanction, there's laws now in place that, sh that realise, that show that if you, if a company in Israel can prove that they have lost money because of a boycott campaign, they can sue. In other words, when Israel and its supporters constantly say that things like BDS are irrelevant and fringe, you know that's complete bullshit. Because the fact is, in Israel itself, when the highest forms of government are legislating against it, they're scared. Mm. They're scared that they are becoming the new South Africa, which is what they are. <laughs> it's not simply a term that is thrown around casually. It's a definition which means discrimination based on race. And a great number of South Africans, activists, legal scholars and others have spent vast and more time than I have writing about this saying that what is happening in Palestine today is far worse than what happened to us as blacks. It's not what I'm saying, it's what they're saying. And if we shy away from calling the situation as it is, in my view, it needs to be called apartheid simply because if you discriminate against someone based on race, Israel is not the only apartheid state that behaves this way. A lot of Muslim states commit apartheid against other citizens. It's not about this being a Jewish state, but the difference is Saudi Arabia is not supposed to be a democracy and Israel is. That's the difference. I think there's a few. Um, there's no doubt that a lot of Palestinians would say that BDS, boycott, divestment, sanction is one. Not the only one, but it is one to put economic pressure on Israel. And we shouldn't forget that in the space of seven years since BDS was called from Palestinians, there's been the Israeli state's not about to fall down, of course, but there's been some economic pressure successfully applied, far faster than was against South Africa after decades. The Arab Spring presents some fascinating possibilities, and Israel is generally quite concerned about that. The ability for states around Israel to be as easily controlled is over. Now, Egypt is almost the, the elephant in the room here, where you have now a Muslim Brotherhood leadership they are talking, being as they gave an interview recently when he went to the UN, President Morsi to the New York Times, talking about what uh, a relationship needs to be between Egypt, Israel and the US. There's a shift going on, but we shouldn't also forget that Egypt gets $1.3 billion of US military aid every year. So Egypt's in a very weird position. There's that. I think there also, as I said, a sense that public opinion in many countries is now shifting.
how that translates to political pressure is the challenge. And I think in many countries, including in Europe, there is a, although the EU in some ways speaks from two sides of its mouth, on the one hand it condemns settlement expansion, but also has been one of the great indulgers of Israeli colonisation project, but in certain countries in Europe, there is growing talk now of far more stringent boycotts against settlement products. There is stuff happening. Again, it's slow, but for sort of those of us who are involved in this issue, it's moving on the one hand frustratingly slowly, if you're a Palestinian, unbelievably slowly. But there's no doubt there is a shift going on in many centres around the world and Israel doesn't know how to handle that. I wanted to uh, do a, a tour for the book in Palestine, Israel, but I was very conscious of doing particularly an event in Israel because I wanted to reach at least you know three Jews who might show up, but importantly, do it for BDS. You know, you know, in other words, do it that respects boycott, divestment, sanction. Yes. And it was important to me to organise an event with Israeli Jews who would uh, support those aims. I mean, for those who don't know in the audience, B BDS is a campaign that was called in 2005 by Palestinian civil society which calls like with South Africa back in the days of apartheid that musicians, artists, academics should be boycotted who have associations with the Israeli state. And the examples of that could be for example the last few years musicians who are uh, pressured to not go uh, to Israel because of what's happening in Palestine. That's been relatively increasingly successful. So I did an event in Tel Aviv. Um, I contacted Omar Barghouti, who's a Palestinian, uh, who's very key in BDS, and said, I want to do an event in Israel. What do you suggest? Um, I want help here. He recommended one organization who I knew, the Coalition for Women of Peace, who support BDS, who have been persecuted and uh, prosecuted by the Israeli state. We did an event in Tel Aviv. There was about 60 people there, um, probably one of the more left audiences in Israel you're going to find. Um, they didn't always agree with what I was saying at all, which was really good. Um, there was, I think, a sense that many of them in Israel, those who are of the left, progressive, call it whatever you want, are feeling profoundly impotent. They feel incredibly frustrated, impotent, unsure what to do. They look at, as you may be aware, we have a chapter about this, the social protest movement in Israel, which last year was the biggest social protest in Israel's history. Half a million people were on the streets at the height of those protests. And as people with this event in Tel Aviv were saying to me, despite the fact that they were, the occupation did not exist, it was invisible. So that event was great. We did one event in Ramallah and one in East Jerusalem with people involved in the book. So I tried to do events in the US and the UK as well, which had as many contributors from the book as possible. So look, the response in, in Palestine was positive, but again, a lot of people are interested in thrashing out the idea of what a one-state solution would look like. And I'm encouraged by the fact that not everybody agrees. That's actually good. A lot of people still, especially in certain parts of the Palestinian elites, who are doing very well, thank you very much, from the current situation. I'm not saying they all came to my events, but you hear that rhetoric often, that for a lot of Palestinians, in particularly Ramallah and near there, they're doing very well from the situation. They don't want things to change. The Palestinian Authority is suiting them very, very well. So you're dealing with both having to fight um, elements within the Palestinian Authority, but also Israel as well. So that's, of course, been something Israel is very happy about. So the tour was, it was great, yeah. <laughs>